Uh, let me share some slides. Uh, and um, uh, so what I'm gonna, the base of my discussion uh, this evening is to talk about some of the work that's come directly out of the Massachusetts Healthy Soils Action Plan. So the Healthy Soils Action Plan was a, uh, is a project, it's not, we're not quite done yet, I'll tell you where it's at, um, that uh, was uh, funded and uh, initiated and funded through the, um, the um, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, through the secretary, the Secretary Thea Hardys, and um, uh, the team that uh, worked on this plan, uh, this was led by Regenerative Design Group, uh, Keith Salzberg Dresdall and uh, Bosch Gutwine, uh, and as well as a couple of other folks from their team, uh, us. So I'm Jim Newman, I'm the principal of Lenan Solutions. Uh, we do climate action planning, uh, adaptation planning, uh, as well as sort of these kinds of larger uh, systems projects, uh, and um, we're based in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, the Perennial Agriculture Institute and uh, NOFA Mass also played a role. Uh, and then we had a number of uh, um, advisors who helped us out uh, because, hey, this this kind of work is pretty big and complex and takes a lot of help. Uh, the key thought in the, this Healthy Soils Action Plan is that we were not just looking at agricultural soils. Uh, so there's a, um, uh, sorry, you're gonna I have to look, <laughs> Never mind. Uh, um, so we looked at all soil types across the Commonwealth. Now in the Commonwealth, uh, I'm not gonna show this slide, but um, the, there, the different land cover types in the Commonwealth, uh, about 50 to 55% of the land cover is forest. Um, it sort of makes sense, you know. Uh, about, 11% um, or so is wetlands, uh, about 10, between 10 and 12% is actually turf and other ornamental landscapes like people's gardens. And about 4% is agriculture. So if you were gonna do a, a plan around healthy soils, soil carbon, soil ecosystem services, just focusing on agriculture would not get you very far in this state. So uh, we'll get to uh, the goal of the Healthy Soil Action Plan. Uh, this, uh, the guy, a whole idea was to protect and enhance soil resources across all different land types, all different land types to support thriving ecosystems and communities. Um, the idea, this is a state level program to define uh, policies and programs that either exist or needed to be called into existence uh, to guide land use planning, which is kind of what we're gonna be talking about tonight and to support land managers, as well as to identify research needs, which we did in fact identify a number of research needs. Uh, probably the biggest one, I mean, there's a number of different things, but sort of, the, the biggest question that really is not very well defined is uh, for Massachusetts is the relationship of uh, um, forest uh, management to soil health and carbon content. Uh, there's a lot of different thoughts about this and a lot of very smart people have, uh, you know, disagree about what this means. And so we've started to do that research and we have a lot to say about it, but it is not fully defined by any means. Uh, if you think about what soils mean for sort of towns, for uh, municipalities, right? We're talking about dealing with adaptation, 
proactive change to manage uh, soils for anticipated conditions, and those anticipated conditions are changing. Uh, then regeneration to rebuild and repair uh, the capacity of soils to support ecosystems and ecosystem activity, as well as our economy, uh, through mitigation and adaptation projects and policies. And obviously we're aiming for a thriving low carbon uh, sort of state of being. Okay, what is soil health? Wait, Bill just did this. <laughs> Uh, so now you're all familiar with it. Uh, again, quoting NRCS, uh, you know, soil health is defined as continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And we, you know, don't want to forget our non-human friends. Uh, that's, they're very important. So um, a key thought here is that there are both intrinsic characteristics of soil and dynamic characteristics. So in other words, there's the characteristics of soil that don't change. That, that, that's what that soil is. And then there's characteristics of soil that do change. Characteristics, some of the characteristics that don't change are uh, particle size, uh, soil structure. Um, those things are what they are. Some of the things that do change are uh, how compacted the soil is. What's the amount of organic matter? How deep does that organic matter go? What kind of saturation is there? Um, another unchanging characteristic is, um, is uh, um, drainage uh, characteristics, right? Soil has certain drainage characteristics that really don't change. Uh, whereas how much water the soil retains actually is can be a dynamic characteristic based on organic matter, biological activity, uh, and general health of the soil and depth of uh, that organic matter. So it's important to sort of keep those two characteristics, those two forms in mind that there's, that there's intrinsic characteristics and dynamic characteristics. Generally, what we're trying to do is optimize the dynamic characteristics given the intrinsic characteristics. Now, in Plimpton, the intrinsic characteristics are pretty fantastic. And that's a key thing to keep in mind. So if you think about uh, soil functions that support ecosystems, obviously uh, biodiversity, biological activity and diversity is a key uh, function. Water storage and filtration, key function. If we're talking about stormwater management, we're talking about managing flooding in uh, change precipitation uh, st uh, situations, uh, those things, managing stormwater and filtration is key. Uh, productive capacity for agricultural soils. And then carbon capture and storage. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, uh, carbon capture, uh, so th this is one of those, we'll have a slide about this in a minute. I won't get into it. Okay, let's talk about Plumpton. So map of the town. Uh, with land cover uh, and uh, with land cover types. So the uh, lighter, the blue, the lighter blue is wetland. Look how much wetland there is. The gray is agriculture. So there's about 3,000 acres of wetland in the town and about 1,000 acres of agriculture. Uh, and there's about 3,000 acres of forest. So the two big categories of land cover are wetland and forest, with agriculture sort of sneaking up number three. Uh, and way more than impervious surface. And my understanding is that that actually is sort of, that's one of the issues. It's not that there's not impervious surface, it's that there's pressure for more development. And the question is, where, how, how do you manage that to maintain the ecosystem services that are so important that it, essentially this town is exporting ecosystem services to the whole area. Um, then if you look at carbon stocks, so I'm gonna flip between these for a sec, but the darker areas are higher 
uh, carbon stocks, higher pools of carbon. This is again from the, um, the uh, NRCS uh, soil map process. Um, and I'll just warn you that the NRCS soil map is based on estimations from a whole collection of soil sampling sort of spread all over the state. Um, it's, it's interesting and good, but probably not completely accurate, but it's reasonably accurate. So if you look at those soil stocks and then you flip back to uh, land cover, go back to soil stocks, let's see. How about there? What's that? That's probably right there. So darn, it looks like the big soil, uh, soil organic carbon stocks uh, are in wetlands. Interesting. Well, if you look at uh, what the research says about where soil organic carbon stocks are, Wetlands are where carbon stocks are pooled. Uh, forests, agriculture, turf are all kind of similar. Now, one of the things NRCS doesn't really respond to is they don't count soil carbon stocks in impervious uh, lands, which, but there is carbon in that soil. Um, uh, but that's the, wetlands, uh, carbon stocks, even, you know, and obviously there's a range and the, the, the range bars show you the range. Uh, and so, you know, doesn't mean it's exactly 320 uh, metric tons per acre, uh, but it means it's a lot. And it's a lot compared to the other land covers. Now in the state, wetlands and forests contain about equivalent pools of uh, soil organic carbon. But that's because there's so much more forest. <laughs> uh, in, across the state, you know, there's, there's four times as much forest or five times as there is wetlands. That is not the case here. So now, um, by the way, if you have a question, just holler at me um, and I'll uh, stop and we can talk about it. Um, and then, so the other thing we looked at is, well, where is development pressure? Now, th this is uh, based on uh, uh, a combination of uh, land use history and the, um, the New England Land Futures Project uh, estimations of uh, development pressure over time. And, and so it's sort of a composite number, um, but the, um, the current development pressure from that analysis, right? That's not an analysis that actually talks to you and says, oh, where is development pressure? Which would be a more accurate way to figure that out. Uh, but uh, it sort of indicates, well, there'll be development around roadways and, and different kinds of things. Where is that? And you can start to see in some of that, well, it's not as directly related to wetlands. Um, I'm gonna flip back for a sec. Um, but it's also, it is kind of directly related to agricultural land. Um, that agricultural land is a likely area for uh, development. Um, and so that's something to be th thoughtful about. And this is something obviously towns, municipalities all over the state are concerned about this. Um, and so there's a, you know, there's a question about what do you wanna do? How do you want this process to, to move forward? And how do you manage that development pressure? You know, are there, do you move development to areas of lower value, uh, ecological value? which is one of our suggestions. Do you restrict development through uh, um, information provided in, in this kind of analysis? Uh, or uh, do you presume that there's some lands that get sacrificed to development uh, for tax purposes? All of those are super viable 
appropriate ways to think through uh, what the issues are. Um, now we talked, I talked briefly about sort of what the dynamic pro properties of <coughs> carbon and um, the, so the red arrows are emissions. Uh, the gray red arrow, part of the arrow is avoided emissions uh, under certain circumstances, which I'll describe in a sec. Uh, the uh, dark green arrows are sequestration uh, in 2050 under certain scenarios. And the light uh, green is uh, current sequestration potential within, uh, if you sort of follow reasonable management practices. Um, you note, if you look at the wetlands number, so forests is not as big a deal in Plimpton, uh, and urban areas are also not as big a deal. Uh, but also note in the urban areas that really it's all, there's not, the emissions are not, it's already developed. Most of the emissions that come in the other uh, <coughs> categories of land use, uh, that we're talking about here are emissions that come from land uh, conversion. Uh, it's conversion of forest to development, conversion of wetlands to development, uh, and in some cases, conversion of agriculture to development. Uh, and so here, if you look at conversion, the, the characteristics of wetlands, that the current sequestration rate is somewhat under the projected losses to uh, land conversion. This is, this is important for Plimpton. Uh, and so the idea with some of the things that we'll talk about are, how do you not have that emissions from land conversion? That's going to be the big move here. And when we talk about emissions loss from land conversion, it's probably valuable to, to make the point that car soil organic carbon is a great and reasonably measurable proxy for soil health in general. Uh, it's a pretty good proxy for soil microbial activity. Uh, it's a pretty good proxy for uh, the productivity of soil, both, you know, sort of agricultural productivity, but just plant productivity in general. Um, and it's a pretty good proxy for uh, water retention and uh, purification. So all of those other characteristics that are, that are actually really important um, are kind of... Uh, shown in, they, they correlate very closely with soil organic carbon. Now, let me make one more point, And that is that, remember we were talking about the difference between intrinsic characteristics and dynamic characteristics of soil. So over time, uh, deep roots, so deep roots of trees, deep roots of uh, sort of shrubs and perennials, and deep roots of say, wetlands, grasses, uh, bring carbon down into the soil and then go through, uh, sort of initiate a chemical process that binds carbon to the subsoil. And so long-lived carbon stores come from that kind of long time, deep root, carbon transfer to the subsoil. The soil organic carbon layer uh, is more dynamic, comes from uh, leaf mulch, uh, you know, uh, duff, uh, um, dying wetlands plants, uh, sort of uh, all of the activity and, and roots uh, underground, <clears throat> all of the activity that uh, 
that sort of are the dynamic active parts of, of the, the plant life in a given situation and its relationship to the soil. So there's sort of two processes going on there. Um, one is the long time movement of, so of carbon into the subsoil and into a more stable form. And the other is the more dynamic uh, process of carbon joining the soil and becoming part of the food of the microbial activity. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, this is where <clears throat> uh, land conversion has an effect. That um, in the land conversion process, you're probably not going to change the soil, whatever the soil con carbon content for the subsoil is, is not really going to get changed. That's why there is carbon content in soils under impervious surfaces, because that content carbon has been there for a long time. Um, what you're going to affect directly is the more dynamic soil organic carbon layer, which is in the sort of A and B horizon, primarily A and the, and the O horizon. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have my horizons slide, which is a, another great slide. Yeah. Um, but um, essentially there's an O horizon, which is sort of duff and the active stuff at the top. There's an A horizon, which is the, the, the sort of nice dark stuff that you see in a, when you dig into a wetland. Uh, and then there's B horizon, which is uh, sort of a combination of that and the structural soil. And it's sort of a it's less, uh, a, a more dynamic piece of the structural soil. And below that you get into structural soil. Um, the, you know, and this is the, the classic, you know, uh, Pioneer Valley uh, when farmers originally, you know, uh, when, when European farmers originally hit the Pioneer Valley, they found, you know, four feet of a horizon because it had been a lake and the, all that material had just settled there. Well, I bet there are places in Plimpton where there's some pretty deep a horizon. Uh, so um, the, when there is a development of land, that A horizon and some of the B is scraped uh, and set aside. In many cases, if it's nice, it'll be sold. Um, and then you start fresh, right? You, and you start all over again. Uh, and, and essentially all of that carbon in, that is in soil organic carbon in that soil is released. Um, maybe it's actually 80%, but it's most of it. So now if you think about strategies for uh, soil health in looking at, so there are a couple of different ways that we were, you know, that, that things that affect soil that aren't just people, right? So one of them is, uh, so in looking at natural lands, and when we say working lands, we mean, uh, agriculture and working forests, but natural and working lands is not developed lands. Um, to actually actively manage those for climate adaptation, to manage soils for accelerated carbon drawdown. In other words, to, to feed the soils so that they pull more carbon. Uh, to uh, restore degraded wetlands and forests, to support coastal habitat migration, because um, in coastal communities, with sea level rise, those coastal wetlands will need to migrate inward uh, uh, to increase monitoring so that we know what's going on uh, and then to incentivize integration of tree crops and other perennials into farmland, which helps to do that uh, work of taking uh, soil from or carbon from the air and from the upper levels of soil down into the deeper soil. In developed lands, we're talking about increasing protection of soil during construction, um, uh, incentive, uh, incentivize uh, infill development as opposed to using converting lands that are rich in carbon and ecosystem services uh, to expand green infrastructure in those developed lands 
both because it protects the undeveloped lands and also provides a, a, um, a carbon store itself uh, in those uh, as buffers and then to also clean toxic soils. <clears throat> so the things that affect soil health, right? Uh, climate change, natural hazards, um, that has a big effect. As it turns out, as soil gets warmer, this is one of the things we learned from one of our advisors, uh, Kristen DeAngelis, who's a researcher in uh, soil uh, um, biochemistry at UMass, um, that uh, they're doing this great, <laughs> a great project at uh, the Harvard Forest where they uh, have plots of land, they're not huge, little plots of land that they measure uh, biochemical activity and they have heaters. And so they have a bunch of control plots and then they have some <coughs> test plots that are heated by the heaters like to half a degree above ambient temperature or maybe a degree above ambient temperature and to sort of track what happens. And one of the things I find is that um, microbial activity goes up as the, temp as the soil gets warmer, which means that the microbial activity chews up more carbon and releases it. So with the temperature rise, actually soil stocks in especially in the A horizon in soil organic carbon actually decrease a little bit, which is kind of unfortunate. Other big vulnerability is land conversion. And then there's a third one, which is land management. We haven't talked much about that, uh, but um, uh, I'll bring that up in a minute. If you think about climate change, you know, this is a picture of the, the, you know, the bottom of the Connecticut River and all of the soil that got washed out during Hurricane Irene. Um, it's kind of scary. It's like, uh, land conversion is obviously the biggest threat in Massachusetts, and I suspect is an impending threat for Plimpton. <clears throat> we lose a lot of forest land. We lose some agricultural land uh, to um, land de to development, generally low density residential development. Um, and then management practices. Uh, how do we uh, manage the lands that we do manage? Uh, you know, you're probably not managing the wetlands, although you're probably managing some of the some of the cranberry bogs. You're probably managing uh, some of the. You're certainly managing the uh, agricultural land, or somebody is. Uh, somebody is certainly managing any town open space. Uh, and there's probably some lawns that are being managed. So those are all opportunities to change management practices to enhance ecosystem services, enhance soil health, and enhance, you know, sort of carbon sequestration potential. So the four general management principles is minimize soil disturbance, maximize soil cover. It's the whole thing about cover crops and things like that. Um, Maximize biodiversity, which means maximize the species that are there, uh, especially plant species. And then uh, maximize the presence of living roots. Uh, so those are management practices for, uh, and, and can be applied sort of across, you know, people think about these as agricultural management practices, but they can be applied to your lawn just as well. So how does this all relate to Plimpton and sort of the vulnerability of the lands we've just talked about? Right? And first, identifying the existing and future climate vulnerabilities and strengths is probably key. And second, identifying the opportunities to take action to both reduce risk and build those soil uh, uh, carbon characteristics for resilience. So, The Healthy Soils uh, uh, Action Plan is at a point right now where uh, the plan has been written. It's been, uh, we had a 
fantastic uh, work group of composed of about 40 people, folks from across the state, uh, advocates, um, folks who worked for different departments in the state, <clears throat> a number of municipal uh, folks, some CONCOM people, uh, some watershed people. Uh, um, it's just a whole range of folks, um, a number of land trust folks, some foresters, uh, a number of farmers, um, and that whole process. So they help generate the thinking and then also reviewed and, and critiqued the, the texts and recommendations. After that process happened, uh, the, um, uh, the report went to uh, Tom Anderson uh, at EOEA who has been managing this project and Bob O'Connor. You guys probably know Bob, Bob gets around uh, and uh, um, and it's fantastic. Bob is one of the most knowledgeable people we have met in these topics. Um, and uh, uh, so they sort of went through it. Uh, we made some adjustments. It is now sitting on the secretary's desk. Uh, secretary and her team are reviewing the report. It'll probably be another month or two before they're done. And the report will be released by the governor. Uh, and um, can then be acted on, although it's already being acted on. Um, one of the things that we, we've heard three or four places is this is, <coughs> these, these recommendations are already starting to take hold in different settings. We have also stepped into doing a more focused version of this in uh, three towns um, uh, just outside of 128, uh, Bolton, Harvard, and uh, the Devons Enterprise uh, Zone. And um, uh, so we're sort of taking these recommendations and this, this whole concept and applying it and doing the research in those locations to really understand what these things mean on the ground. And to some extent, that's what we're doing tonight is we did some research, pulled a bunch of numbers, started to understand what was happening right here. So these recommendations are really pretty much about right here. So first, no net loss, right? No net loss of forest, no net loss of wetlands. Those are the big ones. Wetlands is huge. There's so much in the way of wetlands in, in this area that um, it's, it's a giant carbon pool. And you know we know that the Wetlands Protection Act does a pretty good job, but it also allows some wetlands conversion to be replicated uh, in another location. Well, unfortunately, replicated wetlands are nowhere near as effective at ecosystem services and carbon storage as the original wetlands. <coughs> and so either the team that replicates the wetlands better be really, really good, or you're gonna lose a bunch of carbon out of that process. Um, and then also starting to look at adaptation efforts. So again, wetlands are super valued. Uh, the CONCOMs uh, are, play a vital role um, in keeping that together. And this is where, to some extent, some, uh, there's an opportunity for some ordinance, essentially, or some enforcement structures. So then if you look a little bit deeper and say, how are we doing? I'm almost done. Uh, you look a little bit deeper, and say, well, okay, land conversion is the first key. So improve enforcement of standards uh, and practices around the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, local bylaws is key. Obviously that's a topic that's coming up in the next webinar. So that's perfect uh, that um, <coughs> sort of expanding the, uh, I, I, don't, I hate to say expanding the Wetlands Protection Act and, and local bylaws. It's kind of what I mean, uh, that strengthening the protections uh, through local ordinance is a key route to uh, managing the conversion of wetlands. And then the second part of that is what do you do when you uh, 
um, when there is development. And here, again, there's an opportunity. I'm not, it, maybe it comes as ordinance or zoning, or maybe it comes as uh, sort of guidance for how projects get approved. Um, it's sort of up to you where that lives, but, uh, but improving design standards for how soil is handled. Uh, many places do not allow soil to leave the municipality. Um, uh, and um, then having guidance about how landscapes are repopulated, the depth of soil, the organic content of the soil that gets, that gets reset, uh, and um, the kinds of diversity that are expected uh, that will, in fact, rebuild the soil organic content pool uh, of, uh, of that soil. Um, if you look at this graph in the middle, um, this is a graph and is a, relates directly to what's going on here. This is a graph of uh, potential sequestration rates given different kinds of practices that uh, might be sort of the best luck, best practices that might be practiced in, in a particular setting. Note the first item is restored peatland. So restoring bogs and peat and peatlands has a huge opportunity for improved sequestration. I mean, it also has a zillion other really fabulous characteristics and improved sequestration is really, like I say, a proxy for a whole bunch of things, but it's off the charts in how effective that is at improving sequestration. And then restored freshwater wetlands uh, and then restored coastal wetlands, a little bit different. It's not as, not as much opportunity. Uh, and then uh, forest um, practices. Now, in this case, what we're really referring to is forest um, harvest practices. And so I'm guessing that there aren't a lot of harvested forest in, in uh, Plimpton. So it doesn't sort of, there's not really an opportunity. But note also way at the other end of the, of the graph is turf uh, management practices. And so this is something that a lot of municipalities are just beginning to get their head around, which is um, how you manage your playing fields like really matters. Uh, and so there are obviously, you know, trade-offs. It's like people don't want grass too long and they don't like clippings on the grass and you know, all these things. Your local soccer teams get crabby, <coughs> but they also, really like it if that soil is a little less stiff and compacted and a little more spongy. Uh, people get hurt a lot less. And uh, they like it if the grass is strong and green and can handle play. So there's some trade-offs here. Um, so um, I am gonna stop. And there's a picture of an A horizon in a wetland. Uh, that is a 80 centimeter A horizon. That's uh, pretty dark, pretty, uh, pretty full of life right there. Uh, we actually took a number in the, uh, in the work in, in Harvard and Bolton, we took a number of uh, we dug a number of soil pits and saw soil just like this, especially down in the area by Bolton Flats, which is down by the Still River, and in a couple of farm fields, which was kind of interesting. So I'm going to stop. And uh, now is a great time. I've just laid all this stuff on you. The question for you is, what do you think you do with this? Where do you see action at the town level to start to preserve soil, start to enhance uh, management practices. And I'll stop. Hey Jim, this is Rick Burnett. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, 
I live right uh, right on 58, so I get to see all the traffic that runs by here. And I, I see our, our biggest loss in this town is what these tree companies do in people's backyard. You know, we have, we have some, um, some managed forest land, but it's not heavily um, cropped. Uh, right. So, but you see day after day, you see truckloads of trees that came out of people's backyards. You know, then you do get the development uh, in other towns, not so much here. We don't have that big acreage to cut and clear, but I see the most management in this town, personally, I see it would be coming in people's backyards. You know, their, their practices with their lawns, planting trees, not harvesting trees, so on and so forth, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great uh, example. One of the, so there's, there's, this is both a, a problem and a huge opportunity, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, the problem is people are doing all kinds of crazy things. You know, everybody is like, complains about, oh, you know, chem lawn's gonna come in and spray everybody's lawns and it's like this great and it's all this fertilizer goes all over this and there's all these waterways and it's getting into the waterways and having an effect on the, uh, the sort of soil productivity in the waterways as well as, you know, the life in the waterways. Uh, um, and as you say, uh, you know, doing pretty intense things with trees. We used to, I lived in Pennsylvania for a while in Eastern Pennsylvania in the country. Uh, and uh, um, they used to call it uh, finishing your lot in Eastern Pennsylvania, which meant cutting all the trees. Uh, and everybody was always coming up to us and saying, all the old timers were like, you're gonna finish that lot? Uh, which meant you're gonna cut all those damn trees down? Um, and, uh, um, you know, trees in turf, and, and when I say turf, uh, I mean kind of, you know, people's lawns, people's landscapes, doesn't have to be turf, uh, <clears throat> play a, a vital role in adding carbon to the soil. Um, the, from what we've seen, the, the addition of trees to turf area, um, you know, usually sort of around the edges, but you know, depending on what's up with your, your landscape, uh, can increase uh, soil organic carbon in the soil by 20 to 30%. So it's, a, it's an appreciable difference. Um, so that's the problem, right? The opportunity is to engage people in, uh, you can be part of the solution, right? This is, and we're starting to see this in, uh, in Harvard, Bolton a little less, because Bolton uh, is uh, less, it, it's a sort of a more agricultural community. It's more, a little more more Plimpton, but we're starting to see it in Harvard where, uh, you know, we run a workshop and people come in up to the workshop and they say, how can my land be part of the solution? And this is how. And so I think there's an opportunity to really build uh, a simple um, uh, sort of communications pro campaign in a sense, education campaign to say, hey, here's how you become part of saving the earth. All you gotta do is this. These three things, man, you will be part of the deal. Uh, and I think people will respond to that kind of thing. Do you have some sort of specific uh, practices or that you see that uh, you think um, might have an effect? Well, I'm also on the Conservation Commission. So, you know, we get projects that come in and and they're in the buffer, you know, they're, they're close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if there was something that we could hand them, not that it's going to be part of a not, uh, order of conditions or something, but sure. some best management practices, basically, if there is something available, that would be great to, to spread the understanding, you know, how to, how to do that. I, I think that's a, a great thought. And, and the, uh, um, the, in fact, I can tell you, we will be developing 
some material like that for the Harvard Bolton Devons uh, project, which will be available to everybody. Uh, you know, those things will be available. Excellent. Um, Put us on the list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we do have uh, 14 acres of uh, cranberry bog that is, is going to go back to something. So, you know. yeah, what, what's, uh, what's the plan for the cranberry bog? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> is that we what Bill's working on? <laughs> we have not developed that yet, but um, <laughs> it, will be, it will be something <laughs> at some point other than cranberry bog. Yeah. So. yeah, Jim, we're looking at uh, bringing Alex Hackman in to talk about uh, restoration of cranberry bogs. And yeah. you hit on something really big tonight when you talked about preserving the peat Absolutely. Uh, horizon. I mean, it's huge. which, is, which yeah. is huge. And even uh, talking about the forest and loss of forest land and laying bare soil in the process. And I, I loved your slide on the percentage of uh, forest land that was lost from the Mass Audubon study to um, solar. Yeah. One of the things I've been trying to advocate for years, uh, going back to the whole carbon thing, is the fact that when you lay soil bare, you should, uh, you talked about cover crops. I, I always say that um, a simple pollinator fields, if you want to retain biodiversity, uh, I use pink and white clover, is what I've been recommending for years. Low maintenance, no maintenance, grows low, fixes carbon into the soils. It's Absolutely. everything you'd want, and you can build it out to. Uh, complement your wetlands, you know, go out to your, um, you know, blueberry bush, sweet pepper bush and have a nice transitional edge habitat that goes into your forest and everything Jim was telling you tonight about your forest and your, the underlying soils in your forest and your wetlands in the corridor, the Winnetuxet corridor and beyond that beautiful great swath of natural land that you have. It's the way it is because of what it is. The soils work with the, with the cover to make it what it is and provide all the services that it naturally provides. And I think, the, you know, I always say simple truths and profound clues, Jim, like I did on the ag. <laughs> Tonight, Jim gave you a bunch of simple truths and profound clues as to how to look at what Plimpton has for resources, why you want to preserve it. Look at the people who are going to come in when you start doing your bylaw reviews and your natural resource yeah. zoning that you're working on with OCPC. These are the kind of things that you really want to think about when you exactly. put things together. So I, yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's perfect. Spot on. It's perfect. <laughs> so um, I'd just like to note, um, uh, Stephanie Turn is asking what about, uh, um, the, what, what effects do uh, invasive uh, species or wow. the removal of invasive species have, which is always a big topic. Um, and it's, it's a great one. Uh, and there's some, it's some interesting <laughs> characteristics uh, that um, this is one of those things that's not uh, exactly uh, obvious that, you know, certain things happen. Um, uh, one of the funny things is that uh, um, a number of invasive species have really deep, thick root mats, which is why they're so darn invasive and you can't get rid of them. Uh, However, those <laughs> thick root mats pull carbon into the soil. Uh, so I was like, oh, well, that's too bad. Um, but uh, generally the way we, we talk about that, I mean, it's, and it's me, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, uh, uh, I like to think of myself as I'm sort of the pretty face of this process. Um, uh, I, you know, w I work with a team of people who are really know what they're talking about here. Um, which just makes me look good. Uh, but um, the uh, invasive species, part of the deal with invasive species, it's not the only deal. And we're going to start to see stuff in forests that uh, are look like invasive tree species, but are going to be, we have to think about forest uh, um, adaptation over time and how do we handle that. And so part of that is about creating uh, settings where the natural uh, um, native plant pressure is strong enough to hold invasive species at bay. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, again, managing the wetlands and managing them for health, uh, managing some of the secondary buffer spaces 
for health uh, so that the soil health can support the native plants, which uh, because this, the degraded health is what a lot of the invasive species thrive in. Uh, and so maintaining soil health and practices to maintain soil health can be really uh, important in that, in that particular fight. Uh, other, other questions and thoughts? I love your thought, Tom. So combining a little bit um, the last session and this session, um, which <clears throat> kinds of forests are uh, um, most conducive to soil health? Which kinds of forests? It's an interesting question. Well, you guys are in an interesting location. Uh, you know, I can tell you uh, a healthy pine barren, and soil health is really not that great. Uh, um, uh, we, we did some work in Kingston uh, uh, in that, uh, you know, in the Muddy Pond uh, project there in the Muddy Pond process. Um, and it really interesting looking at, at uh, what a healthy pine barren forest looks like. But um, so, uh, you know, the upland forests, the sort of traditional New England upland forests, um, th grow their soil through leaf mulch. Uh, and so uh, the maintaining leaf mulch, maintaining uh, uh, um, tree falls, maintaining snags, uh, those are key parts of um, maintaining the soil and the biodiversity of of bugs that help break down the soil um, to, uh, to build healthy soil and to build carbon. Um, the, the kinds of settings where that doesn't happen, uh, things like, and I'm not quite sure what you're asking about, but um, so I'll get back to you. You can ask again, a little more pointedly, uh, but th th again, this is that question about what happens with people's uh, yards. Right. If you pull the leaves out of your yard, if you clear all the uh, undergrowth or the, the tree fall out of your out of your yard, and well, you know maybe you don't I mean your yard probably. Yeah, you want to have a place for the kids to play. But you know if you have a couple acres, you know you pull all of the tree fall out of that forest area. Um, that is going to limit the growth of of the health of the soil. Um, and so the natural, uh, there's, there's more wetland forests um, that uh, that wetland forest interaction where, again, depending on what's happening with rain and, and drought, <coughs> you know, forests sort of come and go essentially within that boundary, but that coming and going is actually pretty, uh, uh, pretty, um, soil health driving, in a sense. Um, so do you have something more specific to ask about? And no, then I'll tell you that I can't answer that. You, uh. you got at what I was curious about, particularly the kind of cleaning up of leaves and uh, dead things that, that aren't helpful. Yeah, yeah, there was an interesting, um, we had a, so we had a, uh, <laughs> You can you can go watch some videos. Uh, it's about fifteen hours of videos. Um, the uh, we did some tours in uh, Bolton and Devons, um, looking at uh, wetlands, agricultural land, and forests. Uh, and the forest we were looked at uh, actually was a forest in um, Groton that. Uh, New England Forestry Foundation managed, um, which managed for harvest, right? They actually harvest the forest. Uh, <coughs> their harvest process leaves a whole bunch of uh, cut, um, there's a word for it, I'm not gonna remember, uh, 
the, the branches and leaves. Um, Rash? Uh, yeah, there's Maybe another term. Say. But slash. Yeah, slash. Uh, slash yeah. But there's another term that's more scientific. I can't remember what it is. Uh, um, but yeah, slash essentially. Leave the slash on the ground when they harvest. They harvest about every 35 years. So it's a much slower harvest cycle. Uh, and um, they're super careful about uh, harvesting in the winter so that the land is frozen, which is one of those things you kind of have to do in Massachusetts anyway. Um, uh, the effect on regrowth and on habitat, animal habitat, is huge. You can see it in the forest. Um, and they essentially don't, we did some, again, did some soil pits and started to look at the, what had happened to the soil in that process and then what happened in pieces of the forest that hadn't been touched and things like that. Um, and it's pretty impressive. The soil is in pretty good shape. Um, we also talked to uh, Neil Angus and Devons, who's with the planner, planner at Devons, about too much slash. And so there's, there's a certain point at which and too much slash happens when people dump slash in a forest, right? Uh, so, and that happens, right? Uh, somebody cuts a bunch of stuff, they gotta, uh, I gotta get rid of this, they pull into some forest and dump it. And then what happens is the habitat gets um, skewed and it's too dense for the various critters to live in. And so that it never gets chewed up. And so it becomes kind of a, a deadening mat. So on the one hand, you want slash, you want the natural fall. And on the other hand, you don't want to get out of hand. Uh, and so is, you know, a little bit of a balance, but it's, I mean, it's not a, it's not a hard balance to understand, you know, you, you can see it. <coughs> is it. Is there any attempt being made to reach out to ocean spray and the cranberry growers with this information? Because they control the bulk of what you showed us on your maps in this town. Oh, really? And, oh, absolutely. They're the largest landowners in our town. And they, own, they don't just own the bogs. In many cases, they own the upland. Right. And in many cases, they own the wetlands. And, you know, having lived here for many years, you know, I don't want to paint a group of people with a broad brush, but I don't see a lot of stewardship of the land going on in those places. That's a that's an interesting statement. I mean, I hadn't realized quite how much the the uh, the the agriculture in the town was bogs essentially was cranberry bogs, active cranberry bogs, um, so. and um, I think that's so. The question I'd asked is, what are they managing that land for? And uh, they may not. Be, I mean, anything other than the bogs itself. Um, they may not be managing it for much, but no, they may be. We, we had a huge amount of activity in Plimpton in the last five years with bog uplands being converted to commercial solar farms, mm -hmm. in which case they were actually clear cutting the yeah. forest. Yeah, that's huge. So we, had, we passed the bylaw, I believe it was last year, everyone, right? Um, mm -hmm. to try to manage that so that we didn't have wholesale destruction of the forest in this town. Mm -hmm. But I, I would love to see the, the, this type of education going out to Ocean Spray, the cooperative, and the cranberry growers. I think it would be really helpful to them. I think that's a great idea um, and uh, would love to engage in that. Um, the... The Brian, extent... Wick. Brian Wick is the executive director of Ocean Spray and he lives in Clinton. Huh. So I certainly would recommend somebody reaching out to Brian. Uh -huh. I have the opportunity to work with Brian quite a bit, actually. So, I mean, I, I'm sure I can direct him to the uh, to our website, our project website. And uh, it'd be probably be good to invite him to uh, some of these things, too. Make sure that he gets invited because I know I he's interested. So. He came to our um, Cranberry Bog Conversion Workshops last year that we did with uh, Alex Hackman, too. In fact, he was a presenter. So, Great. Yep. 
he's up. But I'm sure, Jim, once once the uh, Healthy Soils Action Plan's available, that's the kind of thing that you want as a resource for your, you know, your service group, your service area, the growers. Absolutely. Yep. Um, interestingly, one of the big uh, groups that participated in the work group and in really looking at the uh, things, should I let Dave Alberti into the, uh, into the meeting? Not that guy. Oh, yeah. He's always cutting trees. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there we go. The, uh, um, it's because I'm a co-host, I get to see that stuff. Uh, um, the, so one of the groups that was actually very active was the um, Massachusetts uh, uh, Association of Lawn Care Professionals. There you go. Yeah. And they were like, look, lawns do a lot for you. You know, we want people to treat lawns well. We want better management. And, uh, and they were very active in the process and, and have been really strong advocates. Uh, so, you know, the fact that somebody, you know, may, <laughs> may not uh, be, you know, doing sort of the things you would be doing, it doesn't mean they're not going to be advocates for this kind of thing. Um, because it serves them as well, right? I think it's a great point. If I could chime in just a minute back to the cranberry growers, most of them manage their excess land for a buffer. Mm -hmm. You know, they like to have a buffer around their bogs. They don't like to have to sell off and have house lots right there because that it always leads to conflict. But with the poor cranberry prices, people are forced into trying to do something to maintain their land. So absolutely. I know that's why a lot of stuff is gone for solar. Yep. Uh, you know, they, they hold off the last, they sell their land and that's, that's how they make a living. So it's, it's been difficult. I know in town here, we've got, we've got some bog owners that are, that are aging out and they don't have anybody to take over They're but they're looking for a way to, to have some secure uh, right, trying to trying to figure out how they cash out at some level yeah, yeah. just like any business owner unfortunately you know it's difficult uh paying taxes and and upkeep and maintenance so they've got they've got to do something uh, their last is, choice is to sell the land they really they really are pretty good stewards of the land you know they're yeah. on the cutting edge of of anything new as far as uh chemicals and pesticides they're you know they're forced into it whether they like it or not but they're they are on the cutting edge so. Well, and this is um, uh, th this is a very very much equivalent to the conversation we've been having with some of the uh, uh, orchard owners. Yeah. Um, where uh, you know, same deal. These guys are aging out. Uh, they've got orchards. You know, the orchards can't compete with apples from Washington State. There's no way. Right. Uh, and, but they have a local business, it's a thing, it's a, it's a going concern. Um, and, you know, they could make pretty good money selling that land because there's really not a lot of developable land in certain places like Harvard. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and so I was like, what are we gonna do about this? So this is where, and you're starting to see it, it from the governor's office, um, the concept of, uh, potential carbon payments. Um, and, you know, from what we just saw right, in those graphs, it's like carbon payments. It's like, we want those bugs. Sure. That, that, that's the stuff we want. Uh, and so there's, I think there is an opportunity to develop a sort of a new, probably not giant, but functional revenue stream for uh, active uh, cranberry uh, farmers That's to, great. with a little bit of, you know, screwing around with practices and doing a little bit of testing, but not enough to cost a lot to actually generate payments for carbon storage, um, which I think is a really positive move. Something is we've really been arguing for, Every for just this reason. Part of the state. Yeah. <clears throat> because it's really tricky to to maintain those agricultural uh, settings. It's, you know, the economics are totally skewed 
at this point. Oh, yeah. And they go up and down, you know, it's like. Sure. Yep. Great. Well. Right. Great. Well, thank you. My thank pleasure. You. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to holler at me. And I probably will not be able to answer them, but I will get you to the person who can. Uh, and uh, um, we have tons of resources uh, working on this stuff. Um, and so it's a pretty good, you know, we can, we can probably pretty much answer whatever you need. Um, All right. I just, I just want to make a quick comment about Rick, what you were saying about everybody cutting their trees down. That is because they're all coming down in these huge storms, which ironically is from climate change. So it's kind of a... Um, Partly, yes. Yeah. Yep. So we, we talked about that uh, quite a lot in, uh, in the Bolton area. For, you know, it's lots of forests. People have forests in their yards. Everybody's worried about these things. They're worried about taking the lines down. They're worried about, you know, trash in their house. They're worried about, you know, all kinds of things that... It makes sense. I mean, those are good things to worry about. Um, I worry about it. You know, I've got a big tree right here looking out my window. Um, uh, <coughs> and that's where um, some management practices can be valuable, right? We were talking about this with utility companies that, you know, a lot of, a lot of white pines in these areas are red pines, uh, and um, my pines are left over from plantations. Uh, um, or no, the red pines are left over from my face since white pines are what's coming up. Uh, and um, that you can cut them to protect the, the telephone lines or you can top them. Right. And if you top them, they just grow more and that, you know, yeah. sucks up more carbon and yeah. it's not going to, you know, you're protecting the telephone lines. Yeah. So, so there's ways to think about how to manage those things. And again, this is part of that communications, right? It's like, look, you're worried about your, your trees in your house. Here's some things you can do if you want to, you know, be part of the solution. Um, and I, I just think that stuff's super valuable. I, I just went through that two weeks ago. They were clear and they're coming up along the road on my, my one side on Mayflower Street. And there's like, we'd like to take all these trees down. I'm like, no, don't take them down. Yeah, I don't want, I don't want to be open to the road. I said, Cut them off flush with the bottom wire. Just cut the tops right off. Oh, just and they're, tap them. And they're looking at me with their heads turned sideways like, what? What? I said, cut the tops off. They won't grow any taller. And they'll leave my hedge. It'll be a nice hedge. And they won't fall into your lines. Yep. So I finally, it took a while. But I, they, cut the, they cut the tops off. So, so it worked, right. It, worked. it probably looks a little goofy for a little while. But it yeah, looks a lot it, less it, goofy than having no trees. So. Well, I don't know if you've, if you've gone to Ireland or not, but they've got hedges just like that that are 20, 30, 40, 50 feet tall, and they're great. They look fine, you know? Uh, you got your privacy, still got your trees, works pretty well, so. Yeah, I think they kind of- Try to promote more of that in town here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great move. Yep. Power companies, talk to them. <laughs> yeah, power companies are an issue. Yep. Uh, all right. All right, folks. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much thank for coming. You. And um, thanks for enlightening us and making, uh, cleaning up my soil mess there, my last slide. And <laughs> I, I think one of the great things- I'm, I'm using that slide though. Hey, you, you can have that hold back. Have my, have my transparencies too. I, I should have brought my soil horizon transparency. That probably would have made your day. But um, you know, this, this is the thing that um, if you look at it now, with uh, Eric and Neil's presentation and Jim's presentation, you see how everything dovetails one into another into another when you're really concentrating on natural processes and nature and the world that's around us and under us when we're looking for answers on how to do things correctly. It's there, it's, it's learning how to work with it, work with each other and work with it and keep building on this process as we're gonna do through the next few workshops. Everything is gonna come out working together and hopefully in the end, that'll give you folks a good idea on what you should do and how you should do it to put together that resilience portfolio for Plimpton. So thank you all for coming. You'll have access to the project page just like usual and um, I'll keep you informed as to the next uh, presentation. Like I said, we're looking to try to get Alex Hackman in, which would be a great follow-up to this evening. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.
Thanks, Thanks a lot. You guys Thanks have a great evening. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Thanks again, Jim. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you, Bill.